production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. This time on Broad and High, reimagining Columbus through the eyes of a local photographer, recognizing beauty in different forms in one artist's impactful portraits, and learning about using sustainable materials and eco-printing from a Louisiana fiber artist. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High, I'm your host, Kate Quickle. When photographer Larry Hamill was young, a science experiment temporarily cost him the gift of sight. Ever since, Larry has made a life out of seeing and capturing the world around him, sometimes a little differently than most. He has a passion for mixing abstraction and realism in his work, constantly experimenting with color, design, texture, and light. We caught up with Larry at his German Village studio to learn all about his impressive career and see how he views Columbus and beyond. Over the years, I just keep thinking I'm like a visual explorer. I'm just there out exploring, and I keep voraciously wanting to see things that I've never seen before. Being across from German Village, too, I just love walking through the village and documenting how it changed. It's kind of historical to see how all these trees have changed over the years. The new Huntington Garden replaced the old asphalt pathway that was there. So yeah, I, I just, almost every day, I go out walking or take pictures of things just because there's so many different ways to see things. My grandfather was a historian for Ohio Bell, and he loved photography. And I remember one of my vague memories was being in his dark room and just seeing how magical it was when an image appears out of nothing, when he'd be processing prints. So that was a real treat. And from that point on, all I wanted to do was be an artist. A real strong moment in my life was when I was in seventh grade. My parents went away, I'm down in the basement, and I rigged these wires together to create a carbon arc light. And a carbon arc light is one of the brightest lights that you can have on the planet. That's what powers searchlights that go like two miles. I put the two pieces of carbon together, and this incredible light bursts. And I'm just thinking, if the neighbors walked by and saw my basement, it'd probably look like a nuclear reactor or something, because there's such bright light. And I wake up the next morning and I can't see a thing. For five days, I thought I'd never see again. And I thought, well, there's my life. I mean, I want to be an artist. It's kind of hard if you can't see. But what happened was I scarred the cornea of my eyes. So I literally couldn't see anything until it healed. And from that point on, I feel so privileged to be able to see things. I went to Ohio State and graduated with a degree in painting and drawing and a minor in expanded arts. I never had a class in photography. I'd just go through the Kodak volumes of how to photograph things and had friends that I could ask questions of. And from that point on, I realized I couldn't make a living off of fine art, so I uh, learned commercial art. One of my first clients, as far as art goes, was Bernie's Bagels and Deli on North High Street. I went in there and they said, well, we need to do some ads and things. I said, well, let me come up with an idea of a bagel man. So I did that and they go, okay, you're hired. Just do our menus and use the bagel man and then do ads in the lantern. And so the bagel man kind of evolved from that. So I just did different types of artwork and saved up and bought a zoom lens. That was a big deal. My first tungsten light, I had a light so I could have more control. So it was just very gradual getting the proper equipment. I chose to shoot slide film 
and you can only be like a half an F stop off. So you really have to hone in your exposures. That helped me learn too, because you just couldn't make that many mistakes. We're spoiled today with digitals. It's so easy to get your color balance down and all these other things. But I really like the slides because they're more vivid. They work better for reproduction and in print materials. MedFlight has been a great client for like 28 years. I've been working with them. And before that, I worked with LifeFlight at Grant. So I've spent a lot of time, fortunately, in helicopters and shooting air to air. This is one of the best assignments I ever had, and that was a shoot for Sony. And Sony introduced a new camera to video record commercial shoots, and they wanted to show it off at the gathering of Mustangs and Legends at Rickenbacker Field years ago. It was the largest gathering of P-51 Mustangs since the Second World War. So I'm up in a P-130 transport plane. I'm on the ramp here and I'm tethered just like the cameraman is. And I'm using a flash to balance the light with the outside because otherwise this would be just total blackness. So I was able to photograph the planes flying and then when I was done shooting that, I was able to shoot the planes in action. Growing up, all I could see on the horizon as a young child was the Lincoln Levesque, and that was pretty much it for the skyline. So it's kind of fun over the years to see how our skylines change and what are different angles that it can be shot from. So I tried to get a lot of different vantage points to put Columbus in different contexts. This is a series of calendars that I started 31 years ago. That's when Photoshop first came out. And growing up in Columbus, Ohio, we were so geographically challenged that I always wanted to see mountains on the horizon. And with Photoshop, it let me make that happen. So in this particular case, I took a shot that I took off of Nice, France with the Alps behind. I put that in the background. And then I took a shot that I took in Thailand on a beach in the foreground. I think it's kind of funny, they ask, well, where is this? And I said, well, it says Columbus right on the top, but nobody <laughs> looks at that. And so, obviously, we don't have mountains because of the glacier and everything, but uh, I still would like to see these mountains beyond our skyline, but Photoshop was the only way I could figure it out. I've been in, in this studio for 45 years. Over the years, I've shot hundreds and hundreds of thousands of rolls. Essentially what I've got is like a sliver from 1976 to 2021 of our culture around here in other parts of the world. So hopefully people can access these images and make new images from them or bring back times and relate to them. So hopefully I'm providing a substrata of our culture in this period of time. It's just so unlimited, the world that we live in, and there's so much to explore. Every day I'm looking forward to something else I can see, and I just go out and whether it be I sketch it or I take a picture of it, it's just constantly um, a source of wonder around us. So I think it's really important to have that sense of wonder inside you to experience the wonder that's all around us. If you'd like to see more of Larry's work, give him a like on Facebook, where he has posted a new image every day for over a decade. Facebook slash Ham Illusion. Next, we visit Reno, Nevada to meet painter Kelsey Rowling. In her visual work, she hopes to expand our idea of beauty. Her paintings focus on representation and reinterpretation while exploring art history and pop culture. My name is Kelsey Rowling. I'm a painter full time right now. I do a lot of work that focuses on like intersectional feminism because of lack of representation. 
basically just like figurative works of women of color I would describe my work as with varying influences depending on what's going on in my life. Kelsey's a portrait artist, so when we approach portraiture, that third wall is completely broken. So we get to stare at the subject, spend time with the subject, which is the really impactful thing about portraiture work and the ability that Kelsey is able to have on her audience. It's just like this profound sense of like, who is the subject? How can I get to know them? How can I do a little more research to understand them? Especially in regards to the pop culture references and there are history references that she has throughout her work. I get a lot of my ideas from looking at a bunch of things. I'm really fascinated by like how saturated our visual world is. So I like look a lot at social media things like Instagram and like see cool photos or paintings. So it starts with getting reference images. I use kind of mixed media. I paint with a lot of acrylic paint as base layers and then I use oil paints to do my figures mainly. So I can get like really good detail on them. I'll pick just like a solid color that I think is like really beautiful and just kind of base the whole painting energetically around that. And that's where I like start with the acrylics and then I'll do a rough sketch of the figure and then I'll paint it in with oils from there. A lot of what makes something look real is focusing on things that you wouldn't want to include on a face almost if you're drawing it. I remember when I was younger, I would draw things and I wouldn't include certain shadows or certain blemishes or certain marks under the eyes that like really make something look realistic. So I try to just focus on little highlights and different colors and shading because there's just so much variation that goes into a face and like skin tones. I look at a lot of references, but like painting it as it's seen and not how your brain wants to see it. I think that's made me like expand my idea of beauty in a lot of ways too, which was nice. I'm just more accepting of a lot of different things because it all just looks so beautiful to me. The type of response that we typically get from Kelsey's work comes from an audience that's more connected with social media. So we get a little bit of mostly consisting of young people just really vibing her work, really into the subject matter she's pursuing. I know my art isn't necessarily geared towards a younger audience, but I think having people who look like me or can relate to me and like see me as like an artist who's just painting people that look something like them would be really nice because like that's what I wanted when I was younger. So I like hope to kind of have that for people who need that as well, like regardless of how old they are. I grew up in like a different time than it is now. We all grew up in a time where there wasn't really a lot of places where you'd see black people or brown people in things. That really influenced me a lot as a kid because I know like a lot of other people of color can relate to like wanting to look different or act different. Growing up, it's hard when you're just like, where am I in these places? I got to a point where I was like, I can just paint my representation that I want. It kind of serves as filling gaps in places where I think they need to be filled. People gain an understanding and can relate to people if they like see them. If you grew up with a bunch of people who looked really different, you don't think that's weird. If you grow up in like Reno and there's not a lot of brown people, like you don't really know how to like interact with them sometimes and like I experienced that growing up there's just people being like confused by my hair or confused about my parents because they're like a biracial couple so they didn't know they didn't understand more exposure to different types of people just creates more tolerance in a way or accepting in a way or just normalization at least I want people to stop for a moment. I want it to have enough detail, enough confusion in it that people like take a moment to look at it. I'm intrigued by like personal understanding of it because I think everybody responds to everything differently given their background and given their opinions on art. I would like them to just like question like where we see people and like how we see them and like how we interact with them and like recognize beauty in different forms and different ways. To see more, go to krollingarts.com.
Fiber artist Sherry Tamburo first began learning to sew at a young age, and she continues that journey today. She often connects with other artists beyond her hometown of Shreveport, Louisiana, to learn new ways to make her colorful and eco-friendly wearable art. From a very young age, I was always involved in some type of material or fiber my mother sewed and thought it would be a good idea for me to learn. In the 70s, I got involved with the Expansion Arts Program in Florida, so I learned how to weave. So I have a couple of looms. I learned how to spin. I mainly work in wool, silk, sometimes bamboo fibers. Sometimes I get the fleece that is that I have to take and wash and card and dye. So it's all sustainable materials. Nothing has to dye. Recently, I was in a workshop in Austin by a woman from the Netherlands, and she taught a class on making coats. And it's I made a coat, and it's just it's all one piece. You have to make it so large, five times as big as the coat, because wool shrinks. And then we laid the fiber on there, and we had to add different pieces so we could get the fullness. And then we had the sleeves, no glue, <laughs> no sewing. It's all manipulated. Wool has scales in it, and when it's warmed up and there's friction, the scales open, and then they connect to each other. So the scarves with the silk, I have a silk base, which I dye all my silk, and then I lay the wool on the silk. Now I have to use cold water because I don't want the wool to felt before it goes through the silk. There's no sewing on these. It's a piece of silk and it's wool. By slowly massaging the fibers, they go through the silk and connect on the other side and it becomes one continuous piece of fabric. On my eco-printed pieces, I use natural dye. There's a bug, it's called cochineal, that grows on cactus that I use a lot. I can get a bright fuchsia with that. So these were eco-printed yesterday. I cook it for three to four hours. Actually, I steam these in an electric turkey roaster. I love that. I just discovered that. Then you take it out and you let it sit overnight before you undo it. And it's really hard to not undo it because you really want to see what you have. And I haven't unrolled them yet. I did two scarves together on this one. And so this is basically what you do. Oh God, that looks gorgeous. To take these apart, the bottom one had already been dyed with cochineal, the bug that grows on cactus. And then, oh God, that's gorgeous. See, I never know what's gonna happen. This is eucalyptus right here. And this is sycamore. This is more eucalyptus. Didn't do too much there. But this one is really... It's an oak leaf. Came out gorgeous. I'm experimenting with doing a lot of pods. It's kind of like magic because you put the fibers down and then you wet them with warm soapy water and then you wrap them in a pool noodle and you use bubble wrap and then you roll. It's labor intensive, but you get a good workout. When it starts coming together, it takes a form of its own. You have to sculpt it because wool has a memory. I have an idea, I have a sketchbook, so I try and sketch everything out before I do it. It doesn't always come out like my sketch, but it is close. 
and then I will put towels and fabric in them while they're wet so that they'll dry in the shape I want them. The pods are like a cocoon. They're like a safe space, and that's what they remind me of. I'm making lighting fixtures. I have a cage that I get, and then the insides go in it, and then I felt around it. Those are fun to make. Bags. Wool is so durable, they last forever. Hats. I do hats. I love making hats. And I'm doing some jewelry, some necklaces. And I have cuffs that I make. I've been working on acoustical pieces, like this piece behind me. This is a layered felt. It took me about six weeks to make that thing, but it absorbs sound. This piece is called Among the Fronds. First I did a whole layer of just wool on the bottom, and then I made pre-felt, which is very loosely together, but it holds together, and I cut leaves out, and then I put tape in between. I would put one edge on the background and then put a piece of tape so that it, the whole thing wouldn't fuse together. The vases I make using a resist, it's called a resist, and it's floor underlayment. You know, if you're putting down pergo or something, there's that white base that you put down before you put it on there. Well, I use that for my resist. So you cut a shape out, everything starts out flat and you put fiber on one side, then you flip it, put fiber on the other side. And you do that, you usually do four or five layers so that you can get a really nice thick felt. And then you cut a hole and you pull your resist out and then you start to get your shape. This is a cat cave. It's the first one I've made, but they seem to be really popular in Europe. This was all white. I used white wool and then I eco-printed this. This whole thing was flat, and it had a round resist inside. Then I cut a hole, pulled the resist out, and then I fold it. That's where you, when you fold it, that's where you get it to where it's at a stiff, stiff stage. This is five layers of wool on here. But then this is eucalyptus here, and then I have some roses in here, rose petals and rose leaves, which give a nice green. And the whole thing was eco-printed. See Sherry's latest creations at Facebook.com slash Sherry Tamboro. Well, that's our show. Remember, you can find all of our stories online at WOSU.org, as well as on our YouTube channel. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching. Never end in cycle. Right? And when we back in it, uh, we end up psychos. And we'll end up back in that quick, just like a typo. And there ain't no jazz in it. Uh, baby, this the final. Right? Said our goodbyes, walked away and slammed the door. But just know another one will open that has more for us. Even though it's not together, we'll both be fine. As soon as I can finish wiping my eyes, fries. I am the art teacher here at Liberty Tree Elementary School. I teach kindergarten through fifth grade. It is a wild adventure every day. 
Being in this type of environment, I have all different types of students. Students that love art, students that believe that one day they will be the next great contemporary artist, and I have students that are here because they have to be. And uh, part of the challenge for me is to engage all of them, to teach them that there is a purpose for art in their life. Look how beautiful that is. Isn't that cool? And yet, so um, I found out a year ago that I was nominated by my principal, Terry Caton, for um, the Teacher of the Year for the state of Ohio, and I kept shrugging it off and didn't even tell anybody. And then this past fall, I was named 2018 Ohio Teacher of the Year. And this is where it gets a little tricky. What's really interesting is Someone that else. I've got these dual thoughts, right? One of my thoughts is it's incredible that an art educator is the Teacher of the Year for our state. Right? It's this really exciting thing where I get to talk about the importance of art education. But at the same point, why should I be surprised and excited about that? Because of course, an arts educator could be the teacher of the year. And it is incredibly humbling. Um, my whole platform and what I want to share with people is that we have small, small, tiny moments in our everyday lives where we can make a difference for other people. And so you don't have to be named teacher of the year or win an award to make a difference in someone's life. And so um, that's really my hope is that I'll be able to share that with as many people as possible. That we take those moments and support others. Catch Columbus at its creative best on Broad and High, Thursday nights at 8 o'clock on WOSU-TV. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com.